It's good to be with you again, and we're continuing in this uh, these series on inner healing and deliverance and uh, how we got into this type of ministry. Um, there was something in Scripture. I, I want to do a special prayer for all of you uh, when we start here. And you could read this prayer, actually, in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. This is a, a, a prayer that Paul had for the Ephesians. And what's in here, I want for you. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I desire that for you and I pray that for you. We pray every night. We have a, a ministry team and we pray every night. We've been doing it for 15 months now. Uh, it started uh, 15 months ago when there was a, a young girl, six-year-old girl in our church who had a, a skin-eating disease, a bacteria that just swarmed over her body. And within 72 hours, every inch of her body was covered with this uh, bacteria, and it was just rotting away, eating away her skin. And of course, they put her in intensive care. Her father's a doctor. And as soon as we heard what was going on, we went to prayer. And we were praying, we were praying every night, many hours throughout the day. After about a week, the doctors were incredibly surprised because she was starting to heal. And where she was healing, the skin had no scar. After 10 days, they actually took her out of intensive care, put her in a normal room, and several days later, she was sent home completely healed. And see, that healing was progressive, but the doctor said, this is impossible. They were ready to send her into the burn ward because she had lost all of her skin. Well, now she had new skin and no scars and was totally healed. Well, that was really encouraging. We had people from many nations praying. And I talked with God about it. He says, no, just keep it up, Gary. So we've been praying every night now for 15 months. And we're going to keep going until he says to stop. There's a, a piece of scripture here that I, I, would, I would like to read to you. It's from the last two uh, verses in the Old Testament in Malachi. It's uh, chapter four, verse four through six. And I understand in one version of the Finnish Bible that it's actually uh, chapter three, and I can't remember the exact verses, but it's still the same and it's there. Remember, this is the last verse of the Old Testament. Remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinance that I commanded him at Oreb and all of Israel. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of, of their children to the parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse." This is the heart of God. And we read in the New Testament, in the first chapter of Luke, when Zechariah is in the temple and an angel comes and says that his wife Elizabeth is going to have a child 
and she was barren, and he could not believe that. And he was struck mute because of his unbelief. But it says there, the angel quotes this, that uh, they're going to send the spirit of Elijah, and it will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to the parents, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. And this is John the Baptist. And he came and prepared the way for Jesus. He said, look, there's the Lamb of God. And, and, and this is what Jesus brought, is reconciliation and healing between parents and their children and the children and their parents, whole families, whole communities. He wants us to be healed in all of our relationships. And so I like to ask people, what is the most important thing to God? That would be a good place to start, wouldn't it? What is the most important thing to God? In the last uh, episode, I referred to this incredible event that happened in Africa when I prayed for the crippled man's hand and he was healed. When that happened, God said, Gary, I'm calling you to this country. And I didn't really want to go back to that country. I didn't really like it. It was uh, spiritually toxic. It was an incredibly difficult place to live. And then, so I go home and I have a dream. And in the dream, I saw a lighthouse shining a red light from Spain into North Africa. And I sensed the spirit of God very powerfully. And, and, and I woke up and the presence of God was still very powerful. And I shared with my wife, Kathleen, and she started laughing. And I didn't understand why. She explained that when she was a little girl, she went to a camp, a missionary camp, and they asked, is there anyone here that would be willing to serve in a Spanish speaking country? And she was willing to do that. And she really wanted to do that. But she had a condition. She said, I will serve anywhere in the Spanish speaking world except Spain. <laughs> and it was about pride. She thought that she would have to speak with a lisp because up in Zaragoza, they speak, you know, Faragotha, uh, Cinco. And, and, and she didn't want to have to talk that way. Well, she surrendered to God. The first thing that we did is we started praying for intercessors. We didn't tell anyone about what God had shown us. And pretty soon people were coming to us and said, Gary, I have a burden for you. I don't, I don't know why. Why is that? And I shared the dream with them and they wanted to become our intercessors. Now, many of these intercessors were, were uh, immature, broken, wounded Christians. And so they needed inner healing. They needed deliverance and they needed training. And so that's how we started, starting an intercessory team. And that's what God wanted us to do is to set up a home, a house, a base of intercession for where he was going to send us into North Africa. And that's how we ended up in Spain 29 years ago. But God's gone far beyond that. What is the most important thing to God? What is God showing there in Malachi 4, 6? that he wants parents to love their children and their children to love their parents. There was a, in Matthew 22, 34 through 40, it says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And what did Jesus say? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second one is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. These two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. This is the most important thing to God. Now, our experience is if something's important to God, it's important to Satan because he wants to rob from you what's important to God. He wants to rob from humanity what's important to God. So what's going on here? There's relationships that God wants us to express and live in love. So as Satan attacks relationships, 
This is the core issue when we're doing ministry. It's about relationships. That first relationship that Satan has attacked is relationship with God. He kept man from God. He separated man from God. Then he attacks the relationship you have with yourself. I encounter lots of Christians. They don't love themselves. They hate themselves. And then, of course, he's attacked our relationship with others or our neighbors. And what has God done? Before we loved him, he loved us. So God reached down to us and he loved us first. And then through forgiveness of sin and through the blood on the cross, we were cleansed of all of our sin and we were able to then love him back with the love that he loved us. But he doesn't want us to stop there. That very love that we love God with, that he gave to us, he's the fountain of it, he's the source of it. We then use that same love to love our neighbors. Those neighbors could be enemies. Where we were living in Spain, I had a I had a, a neighbor from hell. She was terrible. And so what could I do about that? I, I reached out to her. I started praying for her, interceding for her. Several years later, she just softened. And I remember meeting her on the street. She used to curse me and she came up. She was really interested. Gary, how are you doing? What's going on with the kids? That is the power of prayer. That is the power of love. See, Jesus reconciles relationships. And what we have to do is put the cross of Jesus Christ in the middle of all of our relationships, our relationship with him, our relationship with ourselves, and our relationship with our neighbors. I meet a lot of people, they, it's really hard to love their neighbors because they hate themselves. They don't love themselves. And so sometimes people's worst enemy are themselves. But Jesus said, to bless your enemies. So I would suggest to you, start blessing yourself. In fact, every morning, that's what I do. I bless myself. I literally bless myself. I often bless my head. I put on the armor of God. I start blessing my wife, my children, because there is power in this blessing. It's expressing the love of Jesus Christ and unleashing his power for those people. And what it does is it blesses me. What you sow, you will reap. If you bless people, guess what? You're going to get blessed. So this is the most important thing to God. To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbors as yourself. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, 19 through 21, Jesus is standing at the door knocking. He's knocking. He's not just bursting in. He's knocking at the door. And what he wants is that person to open up. He says here, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I'm standing at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. This is the desire of Jesus. He wants intimacy with you. Is he knocking at your heart? Is he knocking at your door? Are you keeping him out? Because maybe you believe the lie of the enemy that, that God hates you, he's going to judge you, he's going to destroy you. No, God died so that you could be reconciled to the father. And Jesus wants to come into your life. There's more. There's so much more. I was teaching at Oxford, and after I was doing the seminar, uh, one of the theological students came out, and he wanted to discuss some of the things that I've been teaching. He says, uh, Pastor Gary, I, I want you to tell me the theology about that little tiny prayer you kept talking about. I said, oh, I said many prayers. Which one? He goes, you know, the real real tiny one. I said, oh, you mean more, Lord? He goes, yeah. Why do you pray like that? I said, well, it's simple because there's more. How big is your God? How much have you experienced of him? 
Is he a tiny little God in a box? Is he smaller than your head? No, he's immense. And his love, like I prayed with you about in, 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 in the book of Ephesians, chapter three, verse 14, I want you to know and experience the height, the width, and the depth of his love. And there's more. Why do we need more? Because he wants to do more through us, more than we could ever comprehend or even imagine undoing. Where Jesus has taken us in Spain is one of the most difficult places in all of Spain. Uh, the city is 3,000 years old. It's called Carmona. And it has all kinds of layers of civilization. It's just incredible. There was the, the Iberians, and then they believed something. And then there was the Aryans, and then there, there was the Romans, and then there was the Aryans, and then after the Aryans, there was the Muslims, and after the Muslims, there were the Catholics. It is one of the most difficult places for the gospel. But that's where God called us. And I'm really glad he's done that. And it was there that we established our house of uh, refuge, a place where pastors, missionaries, and church leaders come to receive intense ministry and healing. You know, I've only met one healthy man in my life. His name is Jesus. And all the rest of us have some need of healing. I mean, you could talk to my wife. She would affirm to you that I have I still have room for growth and transformation, more room for sanctification. We all do. But a lot of leaders, they don't have a place to go to where they could completely confess, they could open up, they can share without fear of retribution before the Lord. And so we have people coming from all over the world to our little house. We have three little houses out in the countryside in an olive orchard and orange trees and, and, and all this. And they come and we minister to them over a period of five days to a week, intensely, just for one person. What is the longest time someone has prayed for you? Five minutes at the end of a service? We will spend three hours a day. It's like spiritual surgery, going praying very, very deep, led by the Spirit. And, and it, it's, it's, it's powerful because there's more that God wants to give you. In fact, he wants you to be like him. And that's a process. That's sanctification. It's transformation. Because he wants you to be full of his love so that you could share that love with others and bring them into the kingdom and then bring transformation into their lives. The people that come to us are all kinds of people, not just pastors and missionaries, but all kinds of people. But many of the that do come, uh, they were wounded at some time in their life and it's still affecting them. It's not so much the wound, it's how they reacted to the wound that is the problem. And Jesus wants to heal that reaction. He wants to heal the wound, cleanse it, and give us a new way of reacting that conforms more to his will and his ways. If you were to ask Jesus for one thing, what would it be? I want you to, to think about that. I want you to pray about that. Jesus, what would you ask of Jesus? Jesus. In my case, it was to, to overcome anger. My anger was uncontrollable. Even as a Christian, my anger was uncontrollable. I would memorize Bible verses. I would uh, fast. I would do many things. And, and many times I, I just felt even more guilt and more condemnation because I could not conform to what the word of God said. And I was ready to be ordained as a pastor and my presbytery, the people over me were saying that they could not ordain me because of my character problem with anger. And the, the anger issue was so, it, it was insidious. It, if someone 
If someone brought me a cup of coffee without milk in it, I would just blow up. Why didn't you bring this? Uh, and then uh, I felt bad. I tried to pull it back. I wounded the person. Pretty soon, no one wants to bring me coffee. But if I felt a little bit of injustice, all of a sudden this anger just came up. They sent me to go to the therapy. That stirred things up. It didn't heal. And then I had to pay $100 on top of every session. So I went to them and I said, look, guys, I know of a man that could pray for healing. His name is Dr. Charles Kraft. Can I go to him and receive healing? They said, sure, Gary, whatever it's going to take. See, this was a real dilemma. The first night accepting Jesus, Jesus called me to be a pastor. And now I'm coming up against something that may stop it. So I went to Dr. Kraft and he sat me down. And he said, uh, Holy Spirit, come. It was that simple. And I'm sitting there and waiting. And what came? Well, what came to my mind was the memory that my mother uh, went to the hospital with my sister, completely alive. And the next day, my sister was stillborn, the sister before me. And she, she had died that night. They took the baby away. They didn't let my mother hold the baby. They didn't let my mother say goodbye to the baby. They didn't let my mother uh, um, bury the baby. And she was deeply wounded and fell into deep depression. Three months later, the doctor says, ah, the solution for you is to have a baby to replace that baby. Ta-da! Well, I'm the replacement. The thing is, you don't replace a baby. You... you you have to go through that grief and you have to be reconciled and, and, and that has to be healed. It's not replaced. So I told Dr. Graff that and he, uh, he found that very interesting and said, well, come Holy Spirit again. And then another memory came up. And this memory was I had a nightmare every night of my life. And the nightmare was this, I'm flying along over a pink beach and the pink sky is a little baby. And all of a sudden I'm heading towards something and it was uh, evil. It was uh, spikes and, and rusty and, and uh, like, like shovels and swords and knives. And I go flying into that and I would wake up in a total panic just <sighs> every night I had that dream. And when that memory stopped, the Lord said, Gary, that was your birth. Wow, what was going on there? It's like something was trying to kill me inside my mother's womb. He said, the Holy Spirit come, and then I had my third memory. And that third memory is I remember laying on the grass lawn, and I'm looking up into the sky, and I hear this voice. And the voice said, your sister died. You replaced your sister. For you to come into this world, your sister had to die. You are guilty for your sister's death. Whoa, that was heavy. That was heavy. And obviously that was a lie from the enemy. And I came to realize all my life i have been walking around carrying guilt for my sister's death in my own existence. By existing, I was guilty. And when Dr. Kraft heard that, he realized what he needed to do. And what he did is he prayed with me from conception to birth. He brought healing. Those nine months are very important in the life of a child. When do you, when do you begin to exist? Well, at conception. But your parents, they have a spiritual legacy. They have an emotional, physical legacy that, that has an influence upon you as a child. And of course, I was growing up inside my mother's womb that had been a tomb where my sister had died. He prayed through every month. And as we were going along, we encountered, there was demons here and demons there. The enemy had tried to hurt me. We encountered demons of, of, of fear, uh, spirits of um, unforgiveness, uh, condemnation, bitterness, and anger. Because when you have uh, unresolved guilt, that can lead to huge condemnation, self-rejection, bitterness, and then it comes out as anger towards other people. 
And that's what was going on with me. That's why I could not control the anger. I needed a healing at the deepest part of the wound in my life. And that was those nine months. My mother went to the hospital six times before I was born. She was terrified that I was going to die. Well, that was an amazing ministry session. And I remember at the very last, I'm just, in my mind's eye, I'm holding baby Jesus, or baby Gary, and Jesus has these arms around both of us. And for the first time in my life, I was able to love myself the way Jesus loves me. And that's freedom. I was able to love myself the very way that Jesus loves me. And I was healed. And when I went home and I talked with my wife, she could tell something had changed. The next day when there was a slight injustice or whatever, I I, I was very kind and gentle with the person and, and we resolved the issue. And they said, what happened to Gary? Well, I received my inner healing. And that was the first of several series of inner healings that transformed my life and called me to the ministry that we're into today. In the next episode, I would like to pray with you so that you too can experience this love of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin and the restoration of relationship with yourself. How many of you right now are having a hard time loving yourself? Are you believing lies of the enemy? Lord Jesus, I ask that you would come to everyone watching this that you will come and show them that you love them, you died for them, but you rose from them and you're seated in the heavenlies right now, interceding for them. And you've sent your Holy Spirit to bring healing and restoration so that they would be reconciled with the Father in heaven. I bless you in the name of Jesus that you will have this encounter with the Holy Spirit that you will fall in love with the Father and know that the Father has always loved you. All the days of your life were written before one of them came into being. You were created out of the love and desire of God. That's why you're here right now, is because God wanted you to exist and he wants you to have life and abundance in that life in Christ Jesus. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, in the Holy Spirit. May his countenance shine upon you and may he give you peace in Jesus' name.